the breaking waves dashed high upon the shore of time, and left upon the sands a waif from some fair unknown clime. Our tale begins, as many American stories do, a growing family looking for a new home and a new life. Elizabeth Brown and Asa Battles had married November 22, 1814, just before the end of America's Second War of Independence and after Asa's service to the war had finished. They lived in upstate New York, not far from Fredonia, but back then it would have been known as Canada Way. Ten years and four children later, Asa set his eyes on the hamlet that would come to be known as Gerard. In the years that followed, he would buy up a decent-sized chunk of property to establish a thriving farm and a homestead for the Battles family. After they got settled, Elizabeth gave birth to two more children, including the youngest, Rush Sobieski Battles, in 1833. Local lore has it that the name Sobieski came from Asa's Polish connections while fighting in the War of 1812. Asa would pass away in 1848, and of his six children, the responsibility of the family legacy was placed squarely in the hands of 15-year-old Rush. It wasn't 15 the way we know it or we see it. 15 was really young adulthood in that period of time. Um, if you were 15 years old, you were prob most likely done with your schooling. Um, at least the majority of your schooling, you were expected to take on quite a bit of responsibility around the house. So it's not the 15 we know today. And I think he just saw um, someone yeah, ready to take on that responsibility. He was, you know, just um, a respectable young man, you know, responsible young man, all those words that you want to hear and that Asa probably um, saw and understood about his son at the time. In the wake of his father's death, Rush took his newfound responsibilities in stride. In addition to supporting his mother and two of his sisters, Alcina and Lucina, Rush continued his schooling studying both locally at the National Law School of Poughkeepsie, New York, and lectured at the New Girard Academy. It was 1859 that Rush and an associate from Girard, Henry M. Webster, established the Battles and Webster Bank, a community institution that would define both families and the growing town for the better part of the next century. Ace's confidence in his youngest son had been prophetic. Banking in the time of the Battles Bank was a much different experience than banking is today. It was um, personal, it was close to the community, it built the community, and it benefited the community. For the Websters, the bank became a family affair. Henry's younger brother, Charles, would spend the entirety of his career in various roles at the bank, from clerk to bank manager. But it was the eldest sibling, Charlotte McConnell Webster, whose impact might have been the greatest. Educated, kind-hearted, and cultured Charlotte Webster was Gerard Elite and did not lack for suitors. After finishing her schooling at Brooklyn Heights Seminary in New York, she returned to her home in western Pennsylvania to be an active member in her community. Her pursuits were often for the greater good. Guided by strong Christian faith, she not only supported the improvement of education in her community, but also showed immense empathy for those who had not been as blessed as herself. She was very involved in a lot of the activities in Girard, uh, church activities. She was involved in the schools. She was involved, and she, and she loved it, and really had the betterment of Girard and the betterment of people here in mind. She was very well educated, very well read. We have pieces of her diary that indicate a lot of what she did. On a crisp March evening, the chills of winter still on the wind, but the promise of spring around the corner, 21-year-old Rush invited the 20-year-old Charlotte 
out to a sugar party, celebrating the maple syrup season. A time of celebration for all with music, dancing, candy, and fanfare. Their courtship blossomed gradually. But by 1860, their correspondence had grown in frequency, as did Charlotte's mentions of Rush in her daybook. Nearly exactly six years after their first date, their union was made official with a morning wedding in Hornellsville, New York, now simply named Hornell, and nicknamed the Maple City. A romantic honeymoon was planned, and the newlyweds set off for a leisurely trip from Savannah, Georgia, across the South, returning home three weeks later to Girard. In that time, the U.S. fell into a war of brother against brother. It was a home she sought in a world both cold and hard, and by a lucky chance, she landed in Girard. And here she lived and grew and learned a lot of things, and finally decided to try her budding wings. Uh, Girard was such it not, it was a very small town. <laughs> we took care of our own, so to speak, and we loved each other. We truly did. At one time, as a community, we had five grocery stores in Girard. And at one time, there was four taverns <laughs> to compensate. <laughs> there was no competition amongst communities either. We all worked together as a team. It was a real pleasure to have lived in those days. Named after philanthropist and banker Stephen Girard, the town Charlotte and Rush called home was flourishing. While today the quaint town sits quietly along the railroad tracks of western Erie County, in the Battles Day, the Erie Extension Canal made Girard a center of commerce and society for the area. It was, um, you know, just really a uh, a solid part of the county and a very interestingly um, academic and intellectual uh, town also. Um, it, there were um, several academies before the public school system came into being. There were um, strong social clubs and study groups and book clubs and those kinds of things that really made it not just a you know typical American small town but a town where people uh, cared about their community and cared about the bigger world outside of that community. Gerard was also home for America's most famous clown and circus impresario, the mischievous Dan Rice. Once married to Charlotte Webster's cousin and close confidant, Rebecca McConnell, Dan Rice's fingerprint can still be seen in the town today. Rice even rented space from the Battles farmstead to house his circus animals during the cold winter months. With so much activity centered around the canal and later the railroad, Girard became a growing hub of manufacturing. In the center was our dear R.S. Battles. His penchant for making an honest buck multiplied out from Girard as his enterprises spread far and wide. Along with the law practice from his youth, Rush had a knack for taking businesses from the brink of failure and foreclosure to fortune and fame. From the Girard Wrench Manufacturing Company, to Climax Manufacturing in Cory, Pennsylvania, Russia's pursuits grew with the nation's economy. His multiple patents are proof that not only did Rush have a mind for money, he possessed an inventor's flair. At the same time, Rush managed the thriving family farm and of course, the bank. The bank withstood the panic of 1873 without fuss and the Girard banks were the only two in the county to continue to pay out all demands in currency through that depression. By 1876, Rush's business partner and brother-in-law, Henry Webster, had retired and the bank was renamed the R.S. Battles Bank in sole ownership of Mr. Battles. Banking in those days was very different from today. Now we have conglomerates, it's Chase, it's PNC, big, big banks that serve multiple communities, even multiple states. In those days, it was very simple. There were community banks. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, 
It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. That's what banks were like. Oh, but you're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong as if I had the money back in a safe. The, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house and Mrs. Maitland's house and, and a hundred others. Every time I hear something about Battles Bank, that was always the very first thing I thought of was Rush was just like Jimmy Stewart. He was the he was the guy who was there taking care of customers. He had their money and he was loaning their money out to other people. And he was the guy who took care of things. While Rush focused on the family enterprises in Girard and elsewhere, Charlotte Webster ensured the Battles family name was always present for gatherings for the arts, music, society, and philanthropy locally and further abroad. They were a power couple if ever their time saw one. She was a sight, so said her friends, till kindly nature made amends. As was customary for their time, the young couple looked to continue their lineage. Charlotte gave birth to Mary Elizabeth in 1862, Charlotte Elizabeth in 1864, and James Webster in 1868. Yet no good life goes unmarred. Only one of the battle's children would live to adulthood, Charlotte Elizabeth. Neither Mary or James would make it to their third birthday. The story of Charlotte Elizabeth Battles began. Known as Libby, Beth, or Elizabeth, to differentiate her from her mother, she was her parents' everything. Libby, being the sole living child, became the focal point of her parents' attention, affection, and instruction. You know, it's hard to imagine um, as a parent what that would have been like, uh, but I think it caused um, a, a strong focus on Charlotte Elizabeth as the remaining child. Beth's schooling continued inside and outside the classroom. Charlotte and Rush often traveled with their daughter, exposing her to new places and new ideas across the country. A love of travel would carry throughout the rest of Elizabeth's life. Her formal education would continue at the Lake Erie College in Painesville, Ohio, and the Mount Vernon Seminary, or Women's College, in Washington, D.C. Elizabeth would remain active in the Erie chapter of the Lake Erie College Alumni Association long after her graduation. Charlotte Elizabeth Battles had a lot of education for a young woman of that era. She was very interested in, in learning different things. She had obviously attended school locally, and then she attended post education. Uh, she even attended the normal school, which would have been what is currently the Edinburgh University. She grew a maiden tall and fair with rosy cheek and nut brown hair. She loves to walk o'er hill and field and to the bicycle craze did yield. Uh, Miss Battles was uh, a beautiful woman, truly was. And uh, she was very popular in Girard, and she was very young. Well-educated and well-composed, Fair Elizabeth caught the eye of one man in particular while in the nation's capital. Charles E. Barber was a legal secretary and patent attorney who had promise and influence. He had connections to the highest offices in the land, from judges and powerful representatives to the Secretary of the Treasury. Charles brought a lot to her life that she would not have had here in Girard. He was a counsel for Benjamin Butler, and this would have opened up a world for her that she never would have seen before. It would have been a world of influence, political influence, and being in the world of Washington, D.C. at that time had to be a very exciting and romantic environment for Charlotte to get into. They were a promising match, young, handsome, and both of comparable social stature. Everything one could ask for. And so, on the 20th of October, the two young lovers married on the Battles family farm. The crisp breeze of autumn, perhaps, foreshadowing the changes to come. 
the two immediately moved to Washington, D.C., where Charles was making his career. While the details have never been fully revealed, Elizabeth and Charles's marriage crumbled within a year. On the last day of April in 1887, Elizabeth returned home to Girard to spend the summer with her parents. It was a visit that became more permanent than was originally announced. By October, Rush made the long trip to the nation's capital to have his daughter's marriage annulled. Why? Um, he wasn't a really nice guy, and she was a really nice woman, and she was smart enough to realize, hey, I don't need, you know, I don't need to stay in this marriage. I have a family and resources, and the move to come up and spend a year doing some things that seemed very legitimate was probably a good way for her to ease back into the community. Um, it doesn't sound like what she did was just throw up her hands and show, you know, show back up in town and say, I'm done with that man. You know, she came back, spent some time with the family, got reacquainted with the community, um, did a few things that way. And I think she was smart enough to know that that was a good way, you know, a good way to do it. In the interim between his marriage to Elizabeth and his death, Charles would marry again to another wealthy young woman in D.C. before subsequently divorcing her, too. Charles' dramatic end came on June 7, 1897, when he attempted to murder Miss Dorothy Squires before ending his own life on the streets of Washington, D.C., just down the road from the White House. Miss Squires was Charles's former 23-year-old stenographer who he had been known to harass and stalk in pursuit of her affections. The violent act reached national news. Miss Squires did survive the attack. Even in his obituaries, Charles Barber was described as a rascally crank, and he was also described as getting kind of what he deserved. Justice had been served. The years to come would find Elizabeth in search of a role to fill within her community. Like many socialites her age, she entertained herself with friends and shopping while becoming a character of note for the local periodical's social columns. It was the turn of the century and the times were changing fast with each turn of the calendar's page. It was the era of the robber baron when Ida Tarbell's muckraking was shedding light on the Standard Oil Company's practices and Upton Sinclair's The Jungle was revolutionizing consumer protection. The 20th century was already proving to be a time of transformation. Mr. Battles will be greatly missed among us, whichever way we turn. For over two score years, he has been an active force in this community. He was known to all classes. His face and figure were familiar to all as he walked from his home to the bank. As a token of respect for his character, all business places were closed during the funeral service, which was largely attended and conducted by the Reverend J.W. Reese. Gerard Cosmopolite. March 31st, 1904. When Rush passed away, remember the only close relatives that he had were his wife and his daughter, but it had to leave a huge hole in this community because who was going to take his place? Again, as well as she was close to her mother, um, that closeness got more so after Rush's death. She was close to the father. It um, elevated and engaged Charlotte in um, ways that she would not have been elevated and engaged um, before his business interests and some of his family responsibilities transitioned to her. Um, I, I think she probably expected it, but it might have been just a little bit sooner than she would have wished for it to happen. She dotes on horses old and lame, belongs to the society called humane, 
She will give every family in town a cat, but mind, you must care for it this way and that. In Russia's absence, it was now Elizabeth and Charlotte who took the community stage. Charlotte, ever the humanitarian, gave generously to the causes that drew her passions and where she saw need. Elizabeth followed suit. Nearly every cause supported by Charlotte, she adopted as her own. In 1912, for example, Charlotte donated $25,000 toward the construction of a new Girard School in her husband's name, the Battles Memorial School. In modern time, that amount would be the equivalent to 763,000. No small chunk of change, even for a family as wealthy as the Battleses. Following suit, Elizabeth also became involved in local education. She joined the Girard School Board and became a trustee at Edinburgh Normal School. Elizabeth supported other benevolent causes as well, like the Humane Society and the Erie Infants Home. So she was really bucking all of the trends um, at the time, but she she didn't have um, that sort of um, husband or you know patriarchal you know figure in her in her latter life. It was. Um, very much um, just her and her own decision making. One of the things that's fascinating about that is when you walk into the White House on the, on the right hand side, um, it's oftentimes, you know, people think that it's a sunroom because it's a very light, bright room and, you know, maybe recreation took place there. And um, it's actually not the case. That was Miss Battle's office. That's where she conducted her fairs. She was very much a, you know, a working woman and, and serious about um, everything that she engaged in. Unfortunately, Charlotte's health was slowly declining. With her growing responsibilities, Elizabeth needed additional help to care for her aging mother. One caretaker both ladies were particularly fond of was Georgiana Reed. She had actually been a beautician in town, so she did hair, she did nails, she was very gifted at those things, but she also came and took care of the house and a lot of the things that Charlotte would have needed her to do while her mother was aging and needed some assistance in the house. We knew her as Nan Reed. Nan Reed uh, <clears throat> took care of her, and because Miss Battles liked her so well, she said, will you stay on to help me? And she did. In October 1920, at the age of 85, Charlotte McConnell Webster Battles passed on. For Elizabeth, she had lost her travel partner, her constant companion, the last member in her nuclear family, her mother. Just as her father's passing brought Charlotte new business obligations, her mother's passing gave Elizabeth new philanthropic obligations, but one of her greatest challenges was yet to come. As um, Charlotte and Elizabeth got older, she and her mother were very close, and I think that's also, um, again, speaking as a mother with one daughter, a relationship that you tend to see when there's a mother and a single daughter, and they traveled together, and their interests um, you know, dovetailed to some extent, and they shared just a lot of experiences. They were, you know, quite close, spent an awful lot of time together. Just now she motors here and there, gets stuck in the mud when the weather's not fair, wanders on through vale and glen, gains a thousand pounds, but then, what then? Next year will not be surprised, I mean, if she scoots through the air in a flying machine. Elizabeth and Nan found companionship in each other. Where previously Charlotte had brought Elizabeth on travels and to events, now Elizabeth brought her dearest friend, Nan. Over the next decades, Charlotte and Nan would grow ever closer. 
Communication between the two women became a daily ritual, sending letters and postcards from as far as California when they were apart. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand... In 1933, as the Great Depression wore on, FDR was scrambling in his first months in office to find a solution for the banking crisis causing runs on banks across the country. The president would reach out to all the governors of the country, and on March 6th, he declared a moratorium from the 9th through the 12th on all banking to help the panic subside. But not everyone would agree with these drastic measures. At the time of the Great Depression, there was, of course, a run on all of the banks, and the president at the time, FDR, was concerned about this and decided to declare a five-day bank holiday, which would close the banks, and he felt stop the rush on the banks for people to withdraw their money, which would have caused major problems, and that five-day holiday would slow things down at least for a while and give, give the bankers a chance to breathe and figure out what was going to come next. Out of 1147 banks in Pennsylvania, the Battles Bank was the only bank that refused the presidential order to close for five days. Charlotte had made the decision while she was traveling in California and had contacted her uncle, Charles Webster, who was running the bank while she was gone and the decision had been made, and they were the only bank in Pennsylvania that refused to close at that time. Miss Battles wrote a letter to the president, and you know, it's, um, I'm paraphrasing, this isn't an exact quote, but uh, you know, dear Mr. President, I won't tell you how to run the country. Please don't tell me how to run my bank. I think it just, it made, for a good story, it made uh, Charlotte stand out in her community as perhaps just a little bit more rebellious than anyone thought, you know, would have thought of her. Um, it may be, you know, added to uh, the divorced woman story a little bit, you know, not only divorced, but years later also still pushing back, you know, a little bit on um, a man even, I'll be, you know, the president telling her, you know, what to do. Many people from Gerard came to the bank to get their money, take it out for fear of losing it. And they, we gave, Miss Battles gave them their money, but the next day they were back with their money to put her back into the bank. So she had a lot of faith in Gerard people. <laughs> and she did not close down. The R.S. Battles Bank was the only one in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to keep their doors open when America was at rock bottom. As the military industrial complex pushed the American economy back onto its feet through World War II, the recovering country entered an era of prosperity for the privileged. White picket fences, suburbs, and the pursuit of the American dream. Back at the Battles homestead, Elizabeth and Nan built a shared life. Nan moved into the room across the hall from Elizabeth in the White House. The two women would tend to the gardens, make appearances at social gatherings together, and continue to participate for their mutual love of travel. As the seasons turned, Elizabeth came to trust Nan in a way that would forever tie the two and preserve the battle's legacy. Like the falling leaves of the trees lining Walnut Street marking the end of summer, these two would ever run before the clock. There's, you know, often conjecture about was this a romantic friendship? Was it just a friendship? And I think, you know, it was a choice to stay in a relationship uh, with someone who she had a lot in common with and clearly um, had a lot of respect for and got along well with, and that's, you know, the really important message in this. And Nan, likewise, had um, 
a lot of respect for Charlotte, you know, so much so that she knew that the battle's legacy was something to be kept, you know, alive in Gerard. And so, um, were it not for that connection and that friendship that we made, that they made, and um, the longevity of Georgiana and Nan Reed um, staying in Gerard, settling there, and um, continuing the battle story, you know, we, we wouldn't be sitting here today, yeah, probably having this conversation. So while she wasn't family, um, she was certainly a significant contributor to, to the story. I do believe there was a, a close bond between the two, taking care of one another. And therefore, the uh, closeness became real. Charlotte Elizabeth would pass November 7, 19. 52. For Georgiana, her life's mission became preserving the legacy of the woman with whom she shared her life. When Charlotte died, she left pretty much everything to Nan. There are a number of properties that Nan had inherited, in addition to all of the property here at Battles. There were additional properties that Nan was in charge of pretty much selling, and um, the money that came in from those went into the Battles Trust. It really says something about uh, Nan's feelings for Charlotte when you realize everything that, that Charlotte had in her will that she wanted Nan to do, and Nan did all of it. Miss Battles, really, she just wanted the properties preserved. Miss Reed added, you know, something extra where she wanted um, the White House to serve as a memorial um, to Miss Battles and her and her legacy, and set up this this trust um, that has in turn helped to uh, support and prop up um, the historical society or what we know today as the Hagen History Center. So. Really, you can look at the programming of this organization, the outreach, almost everything that it's been able to do since the 1980s, and it has been able to do it better, faster, and more professionally because of that trust and that philanthropy in place. So the question is, you know, um, Charlotte Elizabeth Battles and what does that legacy look like? I, I don't believe that Gerard would be the place that it is, and how does that affect other generations? We'll hopefully even learn some more things about the family and their contributions. To learn about those who came before us, they, they all have some sort of story to teach us. So just take the time and listen to the story that they have to tell, or just take the time to learn about them to see what they could teach you, even if they may not be alive. So Beth carries on a legacy that basically tells a lot of younger women or like even some males that you can, if they look up to her, that they can continue on to do whatever they need to do with their life and just like keep going and persevere through everything, even through the hardships, which is pretty cool. So. So hail to the day that gave her birth and stranded her on this side of the earth. A womanly woman she has grown to be. Now tell me, my friends, who is she? Chronicles was made possible thanks to a community assets grant provided by the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority.
support by the Department of Education and the generous support of Thomas B. Hagen. We question and learn.